Stephen Mitchell Adams, known to his friends and family as a hardworking and persevering individual, was a kind and empathetic young man, hailing from eastern Oklahoma. His deep-rooted interests in higher education and engineering, as well as his inclination to take care of his family and protect those he loved, was cut short by an unexplainable, unsolved disappearance in the hilly woodlands of Toluca, Oklahoma, on December 13th, 2004, leaving all who knew him across Cherokee Nation and the entire county at large grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the disappearance of Stephen Mitchell Adams and the troubling mystery near Ten Killer Lake. This is Cold Case Detective. Stephen Mitchell Adams was born on August 4th, 1978, to parents Carl Adams and Deanie Hayes, near Weber Falls in Cherokee County, Oklahoma. Stephen was the third child, becoming the youngest of three boys. His older brothers, Bradley and Chris, welcomed a younger brother with open arms and quickly fostered a healthy bond with the family's newest member. From birth, Deanie always spoke about Stefan's sweet brown eyes and his delicate love for everything and everyone he encountered. He was fascinated by people and displayed little shyness, smiling at strangers and rarely crying out. This bled into his childhood and adolescence when Stefan continued to live as a well-mannered boy, obedient yet still his fun-loving, whimsical self. He knew how to make the people around him laugh, a natural class clown guaranteed to boost his classmates' spirits. His mother described him as a character, never afraid to back down from a bit of weirdness to mellow out tense situations, or simply just to make others feel at ease. People regularly told Stefan he would one day make a wonderful father, as well as just being a faithful friend. When Stefan and his brothers were still in grade school, the family did hit a bit of a rough patch after Carl and Deanie Adams got divorced and the family split up. Despite this fracture, however, the Adams clan remained tight-knit, strengthening their bonds even amidst the hardships. Stefan and his brothers continued to perform well in school, not letting the distractions of life take them down nefarious paths. As he neared the end of high school and the beginning of adulthood, Stefan realized he could continue his academic excellence and attend college, an opportunity not necessarily readily available to all of his classmates in Cherokee County. He researched as much as he could the programs that interested him and prepared tenfold for a post-graduation career in engineering, eyeing job opportunities in management sectors. He ultimately chose Haskell Indian Nations University in Kansas to pursue his passion. Prior to completing his degree though, Stefan's life would take a drastic twist in his late teenage years, delaying his move to university. You see, Stefan met fellow Tahlequah resident Alicia Rene Sizemore, and the two quickly entered a relationship. Before long, Alicia discovered she was expecting a baby girl and the couple married. They moved in with each other as Stefan worked a few jobs here and there, but nothing that set him on his career path. Eventually, their infant daughter was born, who they named Cheyenne, and Stefan and Alicia became full-time parents. Unfortunately, however, the stresses of parenthood at such a young age saw the once happy couple's relationship crumble behind closed doors. Stefan and Alicia would get into frequent arguments and soon recognize their marriage was untenable with a baby girl to attend to. The couple divorced at the turn of the millennium. However, Stefan's troubles were far from over. After the divorce and on two separate occasions, Stefan was falsely accused of child molestation by Alicia and her family. 
Both incidents led to Stefan being found not guilty, and the charges were dismissed, but Stefan was still plagued by disagreements with his ex-wife. Even though they had sorted custody battles in court, Alicia would not allow Stefan to visit his daughter on his own time, and instead forced supervised visitations as Alicia fought for sole custody and to completely remove Stefan from his daughter's life. Nevertheless, Stefan persisted. While managing custody issues, he moved in with a cousin of his nearby the Northeastern State University campus, where Stefan had finally enrolled to take college courses. He was doing quite well despite the other stresses of his life, and he had a good part-time job at El Chico, a local Mexican restaurant. He had the full support of his family behind him as the unfortunate disturbances shrouded his life and was able to start a much healthier relationship with his new girlfriend, Brianna Farr. It was looking like an uphill climb to fight for time with his daughter, Cheyenne, but a climb Stefan was mentally and emotionally prepared to undertake. He had already made it so far in his young life and he'd be damned to let it all slip away. Tragically, however, despite Stefan's unshakable determination, his aim to build a better life for himself and his daughter was seemingly ended when in the middle of December 2004, he vanished without a trace, bringing his fight for a career and a happy family to a screeching halt. Let's now turn to the timeline of events that led up to Stefan's unexplainable disappearance. The morning of Monday, December 13th, 2004 begins like any other. Stefan Mitchell Adams awakes at his Telequah, Oklahoma apartment. He shares the modest living quarters with his cousin, but keeps to himself most mornings. Stefan eats breakfast after sunrise and prepares for an important day. He has final exams for his autumnal semester at Northeastern State University later that day and is anxious to perform well. Stefan informs his roommate that he also has a shift at El Chico that evening and will visit his mother between class and work. He packs up a few books and school supplies but leaves the majority of his possessions behind, not needing much for an exam across town. Stefan departs between 8 and 9 a.m. and heads towards Grand Avenue, where the NSU Tahlequah campus resides. Between 9 and 10.30 a.m., Stefan takes his final exam at NSU. His classmates and professor alike confirm his attendance and report nothing out of the ordinary. At the same time Stefan takes his test and from maybe as early as 7.50 that morning, eyewitnesses spot a man sitting in his truck at the Dollar General store located on East Downing Street in Tahlequah. This Dollar General is only a few blocks from Stefan's apartment and the man occasionally gets out of the car to walk around as if waiting for someone. One eyewitness asks the man what he's doing hanging around at the storefront, to which the man says he's a construction worker from Keys, Oklahoma, waiting for someone to pick him up. No one recognizes the man and his activity is considered odd compared to the day-to-day -day traffic around the area. Back at the NSU campus at around 1.45 a.m., Stefan wraps up his exam and leaves his classroom. He hops into his white 1995 GMC Sierra single cab short bed truck with chrome bed rails, driving off NSU grounds and theoretically towards his mother's place in Weber Falls. Within the next 15 minutes, estimated to be around 11 a.m., the mysterious man at the Dollar General disappears and does not return. About seven minutes later, at 11.07 a.m., Stefan's girlfriend, Brianna Farr, rings his cell phone. He picks up and the couple chats about Stefan's exam. He tells Brianna he thinks he fared well and is looking forward to wrapping up the semester. Stefan also informs Brianna that he is on his way to Weber Falls to visit his mother, Deanie. But after he drives an unidentified man down to Keys, Stefan doesn't clarify if he knows the man or not, but Brianna hears a muffled voice in the background, assuming Stefan has already picked up whoever it is, most likely just a hitchhiker. Outside of this bizarre errand, Brianna claims Stefan sounds normal and in good spirits and doesn't think much else of it. This would be the last confirmed contact anyone has with Stefan Adams. At around 11.30 a.m., 
Stefan's cousin, who lived with him back at their apartment, tries calling Stefan's phone. The cell rings only twice before cutting to voicemail. Subsequent attempts to call Stefan's phone result only with voicemail options. From this point, his phone never rings again. Around the same time frame, between 11.30 a.m. and 12 p.m., Stefan is spotted by an eyewitness outside a convenience store in Cookston, Oklahoma, south of Keys. He is by himself, the supposed hitchhiker nowhere in sight. Stefan appears agitated or upset by something, a different demeanor than one heard by Brianna just a short time before. He reportedly gets back into his car and drives northbound along Highway 82, the opposite direction of Weber Falls. This is the last confirmed sighting of Stefan Mitchell Adams. Monday, December 13th wears on, and Stefan never arrives at his mother's house in Weber Falls. Despite multiple calls by her and other family members, no one is able to reach him. At 5 p.m. that same day, Stefan fails to show up for his evening shift at El Chico. Neither Stefan's supervisor nor his co-workers hear from him, a strange anomaly at odds with his usual punctuality. Later that night, when Stefan never returns to his Tahlequah apartment complex, his family reaches out to the rest of their family and various friends to check to see if Stefan had taken shelter with any of them. Again, they are unable to find Stefan's whereabouts and go to bed fearful of his fate. The following day, on Tuesday, December 14th, Stefan's supposed disappearance reaches a new severity when he fails to show up to class for another exam at NSU. This is the final straw for his family, who know that Stefan would never jeopardize his future by skipping a final exam. They file an official missing persons report with the Tahlequah Police Department. Investigators immediately start seeking out the hitchhiker Stefan told Brianna he was driving to Keys the day before. They also put out a bolo notice for any five foot seven Native American men matching Stefan's description as well as his white GMC Sierra truck. Over the next few weeks, law enforcement canvasses the hills and various landscapes of Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and its surrounding communities. When the holidays come and go without any sign of Stefan, detectives begin approaching the case as a homicide investigation. They base this conclusion on the fact that Stefan left all his personal belongings behind, including his two inhalers, which he needed due to a severe case of asthma. At the same time, police look at Stefan's ex-wife and her family as potential instigators. Stefan had been due in court for a custody hearing on December 21st, in hopes of reversing the supervised visitation ruling, but the timing of his disappearance seems like more than just a coincidence. They interview Alicia Sizemore and have her take a polygraph test. She technically fails, but as we know, polygraph tests are famously unreliable, and without any concrete evidence against her or her family, law enforcement let her go. Just after New Year's Day in January of 2005, Stefan Adams' family receives a vile phone call from an anonymous man who threatens to hurt the family if the investigation does not cease. Police are made aware of the call, and the Adams family goes on high alert. However, no physical damage is ever brought forth against them. In 2006, rescue groups team up with law enforcement agencies to search the waters of Tenkiller Lake, a large and deep body of water located in the vicinity where Stefan was last spotted. The search only covers portions of the lake rather than its entirety, and nothing of note is found. These dives are paralleled with ground searches at the Fort Gibson Historical Site, but they all prove fruitless in the end. Across the next few years, investigators scour the rest of eastern Oklahoma for any vital clues, but come up empty-handed. They keep tabs on Stefan's social security number, bank accounts, credit cards, and phone service, but none are ever used or activated, dating back to December 13th, 2004. The case is left cold until July of 2011, when Stefan's father, Carl Adams, submits a petition to impanel a grand jury to the district courts of Cherokee County, asking for a special investigation into the disappearance of his son nearly seven years ago. 
The petition lists several factors contributing to the motion, including previously unheard statements that the man Stefan picked up at 11am on December 13th went by the name of Ronnie Meachley, who was tasked with delivering Stefan and his truck to multiple individuals. The petition claims that Meachling also wrote threatening letters from jail to Brianna Farr, Stefan's girlfriend at the time, demanding she keep her mouth shut about her missing boyfriend. The petition also claims that there are witnesses who saw Stefan beaten to death, that his disappearance was orchestrated by members of the Sizemore family, and the district attorney's office in Cherokee County refused to charge first degree murder against any specific individuals or allowed the Adams family access to any investigative files or any pertinent information regarding the search for Stefan. The factual basis of these claims mentioned are neither confirmed nor denied, but the case is taken up by a grand jury nonetheless. Another five months pass by before the grand jury publishes their final report stemming from the special investigation on January 12th, 2012. The report lists five major hypothetical conclusions in the overview of the grand jury's findings. The first being that they believe Stefan Adams is indeed a victim of homicide and that his body is located somewhere in Eastern Oklahoma. Their second point states that Stefan's truck had been located parked, locked and abandoned by the Illinois River the day after his disappearance, but that it was subsequently ransacked of its belongings, including Stefan's NSU textbooks, which were sold back to the university before the truck was stolen a second time. The report also clarifies that while there were certain individuals who had motives to kill Stefan Adams, they could not discern the exact cause of death, but they felt those responsible actually appeared before the grand jury in court. Most crucially, the overview states that they do believe the killers will be brought to justice and that those who clearly lied under oath during the grand jury testimonies should be investigated and properly prosecuted by then district attorney, Brian Kuster. The grand jury concludes their report with optimism that their investigation and later findings will help aid the search for Stefan's body and bring his killers to justice. Over nine years later, however, and neither revelation has happened. The case is still open, but there are no updates, no clues, and no promising leads as of the present day. Whilst discussing the timeline of Stefan Adams' disappearance, we mentioned a man spotted in the parking lot of a Dollar General store the morning of the ordeal. As random as it may have seemed, the Dollar Store situation may be connected to the case in more ways than one. In fact, investigators have pleaded with the public to keep an eye out for the man who was seen there, who authorities aren't calling a suspect, but a person of interest. They believe he may have vital information to either the location of Stefan's body or could at least provide a better idea of what happened to him that chilly winter's day. The dollar store man is our major case point, seemingly at the center of this mystery. When the unidentified man was first sought out by law enforcement, a sketch was released along with a detailed description built from multiple testimonies of people who shopped at the Dollar General that morning. He was described as a Caucasian male in his 40s or 50s, standing at around five foot 11 inches and weighing approximately 190 pounds. He was thought to have had either brown or salt and pepper colored hair, obscured beneath a dark green stocking cap or beanie. Some people also mentioned that the man had a beard and a mustache of about four to five days worth of facial hair growth. However, this wasn't a unanimous testimony. Along with the green cap, the man also wore dark blue or black faded jeans, a tan colored car hat jacket over a flannel shirt and wore eyeglasses. His vehicle was estimated to be a black or other dark colored 2000 Ford Ranger pickup truck fashioned with a silver toolbox in the bed. He never gave his name, only his destination and a basic reason as to why he was hanging around for such a long time. There are a few reasons why this is pertinent to Stefan's case. The first is the general strangeness of the predicament. 
locals were quick to pinpoint the bizarre nature of the man's situation. There aren't a lot of middle-aged men sitting in parking lots of dollar stores waiting for rise to cities just a few miles away, especially before eight in the morning in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. The second is the location of the man, the Dollar General in question is found right next to Stefan's apartment complex in the 400 block of East Downing Street, less than a minute's walk away. Not only that, but police reports from the morning also detail another sighting of a quote, suspicious man, snooping around Stefan's apartment the morning he went missing. It was never confirmed that the Dollar General man was also the man at the apartment complex, but the fact that the area had two strange interactions with an unidentified male at the same time make it truly baffling. The third reason this connects to Stefan's case is the timing of it all. Along with the parallel suspicious sightings, the Dollar General man timed his stakeout at the store to coincide with Stefan's departure from his home and his time spent at NSU campus. The Dollar General man also left the shop at the exact same time Stefan left class, and right before Stefan theoretically picked up the hitchhiker, later reported to be Ronnie Meachling. It was never clarified if Ronnie Meachling was the Dollar General man, but considering the police are still looking for the man in the sketch, it is safe to assume they are two different people. So, could this all just be a coincidence? Of course, there is nothing criminal about waiting in a parking lot for someone to give you a lift. However, when you start to list all the coincidences, it becomes too much to ignore. The Dollar General man was near Stefan's apartment on the morning he went missing and never returned. He also told people he was heading to Keys, Oklahoma, the exact location where Ronnie Meachling or whoever the hitchhiker was told Stefan they were going. Is it possible the Dollar General man was working in tandem with others in an abduction operation? At the very least, it cannot be ruled out. He could have been watching Stefan the morning of the 13th and waited for him to leave for his exams. Then, when 11 a.m. arrived and Stefan never returned, he knew that Stefan had been kidnapped and at that point left the scene. Again, however, it is also possible that the Dollar General man is truly just a person of interest and had no involvement with the disappearance. Maybe the man is sought out by police because he had the best vantage point of Stefan's apartment the day he went missing, and thus could be the only eyewitness to be able to describe the other male who was seen snooping around that morning. It is impossible to label the Dollar General man's exact involvement, but considering the circumstantial oddities and overall suspicious nature of his activity, it is vital we find the man in the dark green stocking cap to take that next step in this investigation. Let's now turn to the most prominent theories surrounding the disappearance of Stephen Mitchell Adams. Many of the earliest theories surrounding Stefan's disappearance involved an accidental death, theories that included no third parties or alleged killers responsible for the man's fate. Instead, these theories suggested Stefan ran his truck off a road on his way down Highway 82 towards Weber Falls to see his mother. These theories posit that Stefan drove the hitchhiker down to Keys and dropped him off without a hitch. Then, somewhere on his journey, his truck may have started causing problems or broken down to a degree where it was still drivable, but not necessarily safe to do so. This could have been when Stefan pulled over at a convenience store near Cookston, where a passerby alleged they spotted Stefan acting flustered or in some sort of emotional distress. Maybe Stefan was upset about his truck, worried about having one more thing break down or go wrong when so much in his life was volatile at the time. And then, after deciding to turn round because of his truck's troubles, he broke down again, but this time on one of the winding roads through the surrounding foothills. If this was the case, and Stefan lost control of his truck and sped off the road, it is highly possible he drove into a ravine or steep drop-off that concealed his destroyed car, and even worse, Stefan's injured body. When people think of Oklahoma, they usually imagine the flat plains and open pastures of prairie grass and farmlands, 
However, it should be noted that eastern Oklahoma is a more mountainous region of the state, featuring uneven terrain that could definitely contribute to such a scenario. Stefan was driving a 10-year-old truck at the time, so a random breakdown during a routine trip isn't out of the ordinary or unexpected. It also would explain why Stefan was heading northbound after he left the convenience store in Cookston, when Weber Falls is in the opposite direction. If he felt more comfortable just heading back to Tahlequah, where a trusted mechanic could look things over for him, he may have simply decided to postpone his visit with his mother. All that being said, there are too many holes in the accidental death theory to be ignored. If Stefan was having car troubles and needed immediate help, why wouldn't he just call someone? He owned a cell phone and could have called a local mechanic or a friend to pick him up. On a similar note, if the car troubles were enough to disrupt his plans with his mother, why wouldn't he call her to let her know what was happening? Remember, at the same time Stefan was seen at the convenience store, his cousin was attempting to call him, but only reached voicemail. Now, certainly Stefan was agitated at that point and may not have been in the best of moods to talk, but if he was in a bind with his truck, it surely would make sense that Stefan would at least answer his cousin's call and explain what was happening. On a larger scale, the accidental death theory doesn't make sense ultimately because of the fact that the truck was never found to begin with. Had Stefan driven off the road, he couldn't have gone very far after that. Even traveling at high speeds down Interstate 82, the trees and inclines surrounding the highway would have slowed his vehicle enough so that it wouldn't completely vanish into the woods. These lands were scoured by search and rescue teams and investigators, especially Highway 82. A large white truck would have been found, and if a random passerby found the total truck before police, they would have reported it, seeing as though Stefan's body would be inside. An entire pickup truck doesn't evaporate into thin air, and unless Stefan drove his broken truck deep into the wilderness after crashing it through horrific injury, there is simply no reason why it wouldn't be found. Spinning on from these theories came another hypothesis, that if Stefan didn't drive off the road by accident, he did it on purpose. Some believe that the life circumstances around Stefan had become too intense and led to a breakdown, which, tragically, then led to a suicide attempt. These theorists believe Stefan left his apartment that morning with the idea he would not return, explaining that was the reason he left behind all of his personal belongings, including his life-saving inhalers for his asthma condition. They continue, saying Stefan camouflaged his day to appear normal with final exams and a trip to his mother's house. When his girlfriend called after class, Stefan again hid his true intentions, presenting himself to be in good spirits. Then, he used the story about a hitchhiker to cover up his plans, giving himself an alibi, so to speak. This would explain why Stefan was then seen alone and upset at the convenience store. He had never actually picked anyone up and was struggling to cope with what he was about to do. The theories then speculate this is why Stefan's cell phone was ignored and eventually shut off. From here, there are dozens of sub-theories, with some suggesting Stefan drove into the nearby 10-killer lake on purpose. Others posit that Stefan drove off somewhere he knew he'd never be found to end his own life on his terms away from where his family could find him. However, we must follow up this theory with the fact that nearly every professional investigator associated with the case, including Stefan's family and closest friends, have rejected the idea that Stefan committed suicide. Too many people attempt to decipher one's mental state as being fragile and immediately label a disappearance as suicide. Yes, Stefan was going through immense difficulties and fighting to see his own child, but he was also determined and strong-willed and had already overcome so much. In short, he had hope that his situation was ready to change, with a custody hearing to reverse supervised visitation in a mere nine days. To speculate without any concrete evidence that he killed himself simply because his current situation wasn't the smoothest of rides is an insult to his memory, especially when there are many other factors to suggest suicide is not the cause of death. Most contradictory of all, 
is the fact that there were numerous purported threats against Stefan's family and his girlfriend. If Stefan had ended his own life, why would people who had a vendetta against him scare his living family members and threaten them with violence if the investigation wasn't halted? If Stefan's enemies saw that he had disappeared and they had nothing to do with it, why would they try and stop investigators from figuring out what exactly did happen? That would absolve them of any wrongdoing and they'd have nothing to worry about. Plus, there have been countless private detectives, law enforcement officials, and an entire grand jury who have all ruled Stefan's case to be that of a homicide. So it is reasonable to assume there may be yet more information that might not be available to the public that points directly to murder. It also makes little sense that all that bizarre behavior would take place within the same few hours on the same day Stefan vanished too. The suspicious sightings, the hitchhiker, the cell phone, Stefan's behavior at the convenience store, it all adds up to something more than a mere suicide attempt. So if Stefan was murdered, the question is who could have done it? The idea of a serial killer doesn't really get tossed around much in Stefan's case, and it makes sense. There were zero known or unidentified serial murderers in the Tahlequah, Oklahoma area in the early 2000s, or really the surrounding areas for much of that time frame and location. Our research did show there were a couple of criminals and small scale killers around Eastern Oklahoma in December of 2004, but almost all of them involved specific motives or victims not of Stefan's demographic, or were obvious instances of the killer knowing their victim and not just a random murder, as is too often seen in serial homicides. In fact, it's that exact type of crime, a killer killing because of a personal relationship with the victim that fits Stefan's case file best. As previously mentioned, Stefan did have a group of people who did not want him alive, and theorists believe it was this collection of characters who conspired to, and ultimately did, kidnap him. Remember, Stefan's ex-wife Alicia accused him not just once, but twice of child molestation against their young daughter, Cheyenne. Both times the accusations were dismissed in court and Stefan was found not guilty, but that didn't stop the rest of Alicia's family from taking out their anger on Stefan himself. Deanie Hayes, Stefan's mother, told police after his disappearance that at some point between Stefan going missing and the court cases, Alicia's father threatened to kill him personally. Stefan never appeared too distraught or intimidated by the threats, and never instigated any violence against the Sizemore family to protect his future with his daughter. Yet that didn't stop them from verbally abusing Stefan or stop Alicia from going out of her way to stop Cheyenne seeing her father. So beyond a clear motivation, what else could point to the Sizemores being responsible? Well, theorists are quick to point out that the last sighting of Stefan at the convenience store in Cookson was actually reported by a semi-distant relative of Alicia's, the woman who told authorities about Stefan's agitated demeanor and northbound departure in the wrong direction was Alicia's mother's brother's sister-in-law, or in simpler terms, the sister of Alicia's aunt-in-law. Now it's easy to understand how this might sound convoluted and somewhat irrelevant, Small towns across America are known for large interconnected families where scratch anyone and their kin to anyone else. Yet it has led some to wonder if this eyewitness was a part of the Sizemore family that held disdain for Stefan, could they have made up the sighting to throw off police? Maybe this person did see Stefan at a convenience store, but lied about him being alone to give the hitchhiker or Ronnie Meachling an alibi or at least absolve them of any wrongdoing. Or maybe this eyewitness lied about the direction in which Stefan drove so that detectives would look in the wrong places for his body or his truck and at least slow down the investigation. However, it is still entirely plausible that even if the witness was giving a false statement to aid her extended family, parts of the sighting remain true. 
The part which makes the most sense is Stefan's odd behaviour, his obvious discomfort and agitation, foretelling what was about to happen whether he knew outright what it was or not. Again, it must be stated that just because this eyewitness had a relation to Alicia and her family does not mean she was lying or covering up a murder. That is an extremely heavy accusation to make with pretty much no evidence, other than a rough, distant relation to someone we know wanted Stefan out of the picture. Also, if the Sizemores included a relative so far down the family tree in their scheme, that would most likely mean there were plenty of others in the family who knew of their dastardly plot too. Maybe the eyewitness was closer to Alicia than just being her mother's brother's sister-in-law, but there is still an enormous amount of doubt surrounding her potential role in a murder conspiracy. Could she be one of the people who lied under oath during the grand jury inquiry in 2011? That too is a distinct possibility. Aside from the convenience store witness, the other suspects in the investigation aren't as clear cut as to what they mean regarding Stefan's fate. It's still unknown whether or not the Dollar General man was ever located, and if so, what detectives learned about his time spent in Tahlequah on December 13th. It's also still unknown how Ronnie Meachling, the supposed hitchhiker, fits into the investigation. The man wasn't identified until Carl Adams, Stefan's father, listed his name in the petition for the grand jury in 2011, and claimed that Ronnie told people his role in the disappearance was to hitch a ride with Stefan and then, quote, deliver him and his truck to another group of individuals. Who these people were has also never been clarified. Brianna Farr told police she received a letter from Ronnie from jail though, advising her to back off from the case, but it also hasn't been made public why Ronnie was in jail in the first place. Was it for his connection to Stefan's disappearance or a completely separate issue? We have searched for Ronnie tirelessly across the internet and databases, but found zero matches. Could it be his name was misspelled in a court report? Could it be that Ronnie Meachling is an alias for someone else? And on that subject, is Ronnie Meachling also the Dollar General Man? They never appear in the same vicinity together in the story, and the Dollar General Man's movements align perfectly with Ronnie's entrance into the scenario. Again, these answers have not been provided by investigators. Maybe they think that by releasing Ronnie's full profile, it will hamper their investigation. But from our perspective, the official investigation has been stalled for nine years now, and the haze surrounding Ronnie Meachling makes it very hard to get a full grasp on the case at large. Technical details aside, theorists who believe Stefan was kidnapped and murdered by someone associated with Alicia and her family tie it all together like this. Stefan was supposed to be kidnapped at an earlier date, like the grand jury reported, but those plans fell through and they were redirected for December 13th, 2004. A man, either part of the Sizemore family or paid by them, later known as the Dollar General Man, is recruited to spy on Stefan's apartment that morning. He arrives at the Dollar General at around 7.50 a.m. and begins to stake out the area, waiting for Stefan to leave. During his time spent in the parking lot, he also wanders over to the apartment complex himself and snoops around, making him the man who was later reported to have been spotted near Stefan's home that morning. Then, when Stefan left for class, the Dollar General man stayed put, making sure Stefan did not return home earlier than expected. At 11 a.m., once it was confirmed the coast was clear, the Dollar General man left, his job done. This is where Ronnie, or the hitchhiker as we'll call him, enters the plot. On Stefan's route home, possibly where Stefan parked his car on NSU's campus, the hitchhiker introduces himself to Stefan and asks for a ride to Keyes. Knowing Keyes is on his way to Weber Falls, Stefan agrees and calls his girlfriend. When Stefan tells Brianna everything is okay and hangs up the phone, the hitchhiker probably asks to use the phone himself 
This is where the hitchhiker most likely calls the people he is delivering Stefan to. The hitchhiker then holds onto the phone after he is done, and when Stefan's cousin attempts to call, the hitchhiker either turns the phone off or destroys it. Using a gun or other means to hold up Stefan, the hitchhiker has Stefan drive off into an unknown part of town or secluded location, where they are then intercepted by others who take Stefan's truck, kill him, and dispose of his body. They dump the body somewhere in the eastern Oklahoma wilderness and drive the truck to the banks of the Illinois River, where it is ransacked and stolen the following day. Everyone involved gets out clean, and the police are left with a massive case void of clues. In this theory, the sighting at the convenience store is considered a red herring fabricated by those responsible. To date, this is perhaps the most plausible theory drawn up by investigators. It includes crystal clear motive, suspicious characters, and fits the timeline of events. It may seem a stretch to believe that a little family in a little town in Oklahoma could concoct such a horrific scheme and also get away with it. But remember, the grand jury themselves said they felt like they knew who killed Stefan, and those responsible had testified before the courts. This was almost certainly referencing the Sizemore family, since they were known to be involved with the hearings. At this point, it comes down to physical evidence being procured by cold case detectives and or combined with an admission by a member of the family or guilty party. Until that happens, this remains just another theory like all the others, regardless of how well the pieces seem to fit the puzzle. Before we divulge our hypothesis of Stefan Mitchell Adams' unsolved disappearance, we want to make known that our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each episode, and we do not attempt to promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. We simply observe, research, and report. In Stefan's case, we find it relatively obvious how Stefan disappeared, via kidnapping, and then most likely murder. There are too many factors to suggest Stefan ended up the victim of foul play, let alone the numerous conclusions reached by professional investigators and the Cherokee County Grand Jury. Frustratingly, they reveal a lot about the case while simultaneously not revealing much at all, at least in terms of specifics. But they do lead us to believe police have their prime suspects lined up in sight and are just waiting for the physical evidence to surface so irreversible arrests can be made. Who those suspects are is easy to define and is definitely the people who called to threaten Stefan's family both before and after he vanished. Sometimes it is all too easy to get lost in cold cases and try and link victims with far-fetched narratives about random killings. But when there is a clear, cut, motivating factor behind people connected with Stefan, it is logical to assume they are the guilty party. Of course, they are innocent until proven guilty, but in terms of building a hypothesis, the people who literally called for Stefan to die prior to him going missing are, most likely, the ones who did it. So, if they did, how was it done? The final theory we mentioned in the previous segment sums it up best, as we believe the Dollar General man was staking out Stefan's apartment and complicit in the crime, whether or not he was the actual killer. We believe Stefan did indeed pick someone up after finishing his exam, and even if the man's name wasn't Ronnie Meachling, or if Ronnie Meachling doesn't actually exist, we believe they held Stefan at gunpoint and directed him towards his fate. Then, after the murder, they disposed of his body in a place no one will ever find and dumped the white GMC pickup truck near the Illinois River, per the grand jury's finding. 
We wish investigators would continue looking for the people who looted the truck and resold Stefan's textbooks back to Northeastern State University, because they too could hold vital information regarding evidence left behind. The killer could have left DNA and fingerprints in the truck, and while those have most likely been lost to time over the last 16 years, there is always a chance, and chances are worth clinging to in times of desperation. Thus, we ask that anyone with any sliver of information related to Stefan's disappearance, his truck's disappearance, or the situation at large, to please call the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation at 800-522-8017. We also want to take a quick moment and acknowledge the complicated issue regarding the accusations of child molestation against Stefan. We do not want to minimize these types of accusations, but rather clarify we are simply reporting what was found by two separate courts in the matters. Each accusation was dismissed in court and heavily refuted by both Stefan and his family. Therefore, that is how we present the research. Tragically, and far too often, ideas that women lie or fabricate their stories about neglect, abuse, and rape are shared and believed. These are incredibly serious topics and are very real and never to be minimized. Also, just because someone's case is dismissed by a judge does not mean they didn't do something, and that is why every instance is unique and should be handled with care and respect no matter how you feel about the accuser. However, in the end, cold-blooded murder is never justified, and Stephen Mitchell Adams did not deserve to leave Earth so soon and without a trace. He was a hard-working young man who fought tooth and nail to provide for his family. He was a free-spirited presence who loved to laugh and, more importantly, entice others to join him in the laughter. Stefan was well on his way to management within the engineering sector, and would have made a wonderful leader among his peers. Needless to say, he had a bright future, a future cut to darkness far too soon. His family does not deserve to dwell in that darkness any longer. Therefore, it's up to us to rekindle the fire that will light the way towards his discovery illuminating the mystery of Stefan Mitchell Adams and his final drive through the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. This is Cold Case Detective.